Sometimes a child to be is identified by a birthmark. Sometimes a child will start, start having remarkable dreams and that will identify a potential shaman. Sometimes the shaman will, as a young person, go into an illness and will recover from a remarkable illness and that will be the mark that this person is supposed to be a shaman. So there are all sorts of different ways that shamans are identified, but the crucial way is that is the community that gives the accept or reject sign to somebody who is slated to become a shaman. Now, also, notice that the shaman is able to come up with information that's not available to other members of the tribe. Otherwise, the tribe wouldn't need shamans. They have information about healing, they have information about the future, they have information about tribal enemies, they have information about predicting the weather, information about where to find game, so there's all sorts of practical ways that uh, shamans can help out the community once they've gone through the training, once they've become identified. There are four basic groups of people who do spiritual work in indigenous societies. Yes, there are the shamans, which also include shamanic healers, and healers who use shamanic methods in their work. But there's also the diviners, the seers and the mediums. There's also the priests and priestesses, and there's also the sorcerers and the witches, the so-called malevolent practitioners. Although nowadays we cannot call the wicked group malevolent, it's a legitimate uh, religious movement. Shamanic traditions are likely to main, remain open and flexible, while priestly traditions resist innovation. Some practitioners are difficult to classify, and others switch roles according to the occasion. The more complex the society, the more likely it is to contain representatives of all practitioner types. <laughs> Now, in just a few minutes, I'm going to be showing you a slide of the most famous shaman of the 20th century, Doña Maria Sabina, of the little village of Cuatla de Jimenez in Oaxaca, Mexico. And why was she so famous? Because she, without knowing it, uh, coined a new discipline. And this is the discipline of ethnomycology, the study of the use of mushrooms in different cultures. She did her shamanic practice um, in secret because when the Europeans came to Mexico, again, they killed the shamans, they drove the uh, use of the mushrooms and the peyote and the morning glory seeds underground or destroyed it all together. It survived in two places. It survived among the wheat shoals, which you'll hear about when Brancicuta comes, because the wheat holds and their use of peyote, they're in the northwest corner of Mexico, and there's there was no gold there, so the Spaniards didn't bother to invade that area, and so the wheat holds were just allowed to do their own thing, thank heavens, because they preserved this wonderful tradition for hundreds of years. Oaxaca, however, was fairly close to what became Mexico City, and so they had to go underground. And there were rumors, recurrent rumors, that the mushrooms were still being used in Oaxaca, but nobody could pin it down. There was an article about her in Life magazine that George Lawson wrote. He hid her name so that she'd have her privacy. And uh, I read that back in the 1950s. And I said, someday I want to meet Maria Sabina. And believe it or not, some 30 years afterwards, I did. I had the great fortune of being invited by a psychiatrist by the name of Selva de Roquette from Mexico City to join a group that was going to uh, visit her. He knew her quite well. And by that time, there was much that was written about her. And so I didn't think that we'd discover anything new, but it would be interesting hearing it coming from her own her mouth. 
And she explained to us that, well, at that time she was about 90 years of age. Yeah, you see, these shamans live many, many years. They are pretty hardy folks. She was 90 years of age, and so she had to give up the mushrooms because they do exert a toll on the system. And so she had passed on the gift to her students. But she said, when I did use the mushrooms, I would take the mushrooms along with my clients, and Jesus Christ would come to us in the mushrooms and solve the problems, whether the medical problem, a romantic problem, a financial problem, a family problem, whatever. And I said, now what's all this Jesus Christ stuff? This didn't happen, you know, before the Europeans came. And I said, well, how is Jesus Christ associated with the mushrooms? And she said, well, you know, um, there are many years that are not accounted for in the Holy Bible. And during those years, Jesus came to North America and he wandered through Mexico and he was healing people, doing good work, and he would wander barefoot to show his humility. And every now and then he would cut himself, so he'd take some saliva, slap it on his foot and walk on. And with the white saliva and the red blood mixed, popped a little mushroom. <laughs> so, I thought to myself, you know, that story about, about the psilocybin Mexicana mushroom, that sounds familiar. And I got back and checked out my library, and sure enough, before the Spaniards came to Mexico, there was a legend about Quetzalcoatl. Uh, many, many stories about him. Um, the feathered serpent, he was sort of a demigod. And when he was ruler of that part of Mexico, he was very pure and very humble and uh, very chaste, and that was his mistake, um, <laughs> because his enemies sent a very beautiful woman in to seduce him. And she did. She was very successful. And from the point of view of his belief system, he had violated his code to devote himself completely to helping his people. So he gave up the throne, and he wandered through Mexico barefoot, and when he cut his foot, he'd slap on the saliva, and up would pop a mushroom. So Quetzalcoatl became transformed into Jesus Christ. And now the Mazatecs, uh, have the same story, but a slightly different cast of characters. <laughs> but this is what you find in mythology, and you especially find it among shamans because they adapt and they change to meet the given situation. And this is why shamanism is so very eclectic and so very malleable, so very flexible. Shamanism is not a religion, it's a technology. It's a technology of the sacred, as Marseille Iliad once, once called it. Once something becomes a religion, well, then there's a creed, there's a dogma, there's a set of rituals that everybody has to follow, and you don't dare introduce anything new or the authorities will get after you. And so uh, I must say, however, that in Huatla de Jimenez, Maria Sardina had the backing of the local priest because she had founded the first women's society in her Catholic church, and she was doing good work.